What's going on, FA Nation? Welcome back. This is the Fantasy Alarm 2-Minute Drill. I'm Din Malin, joined as always by James Grande. Week 11 was messy. Uh, I had arguably my worst DFS week of the year. I was talking to Grande before we started recording. On DraftKings, I have played the $33 five-entry max contest uh, three times this year. I have entered a total of 15 lineups into that contest. I have had one line of cash, and it just seems that when I play this particular contest, I am dooming myself, and my lineups go to crap. Now, week 11 was completely weird, uh, but you played Joe Burrow, so you had a very profitable week, right? Yeah, right? it was good. It was a, yeah, it was a solid week. I played him on the main and the and the late slate, so oh. um, pairing him and T. Higgins along with George Pickens, that was a nice little trio in that game. It could have been more because George Pickens – I uh, was like, yo, I'm going to make all these sick catches and then drop a wide open. T- I mean, I guess not wide open when like four arms are like flashing in front of your face. But like, I mean, you're George. I mean, you got to catch that football. It's a touchdown. Yeah. Uh, but we have a lot to kind of dissect a lot on the injury front. Some uh, some roster moves as well. So let's just start injuries galore. Uh Man, I guess we can start with Kyle Pitts. I mean, I can't tell. This is probably a good thing for Kyle Pitts owners. (laughs) Kyle Pitts, he's having surgery on his MCL. He's been placed on IR. He is going to miss at least four weeks. Uh, This this is probably just good news for Kyle Pitts owners because you don't have to go through the stress and then the turmoil of deciding, do I start Kyle Pitts? Do I stream someone else over Kyle Pitts? Just slot him in the IR. He's going to be shut down for at least a month. You can go to the waiver wire and you can get – Hayden Hurst, Evan Ingram, somebody like that. Uh, but how do you feel about the Pitts injury? Does this maybe elevate Drake London a little more, Alameda Zacchaeus, maybe Demir Bird? And who are you looking for as a replacement? I mean, honestly, I don't think it does very much for the Atlanta offense. Because uh, they just I, don't throw the ball enough, right? Yeah, I mean, they just threw 20 times this week. So it's like, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, Sucks for Kyle Pitts, and I hope he makes a speedy recovery and we do see him back. I mean, they're still technically in in it in the NFC South, right? Like Tampa's bet one, two in a row, um, but they had a bye this week, and there's still divisional games to be played. So, I, you know, as long as this was like the minor MCL surgery that he got, he should be back in the four week in a four week time period. Um, in terms of people we're looking at to fill his position, I think. You mentioned two guys in Evan Ingram um, and Hayden Hurst that are fine. You know, Robert Tunyon, I think, is okay. He's been very up and down. We haven't, we, it just doesn't seem like he's the touchdown guy we, you know, we got a couple of years ago that would just always seem like an aberration. I, I'm interested to see what Trey McBride um, does tonight. We are recording on Monday night. He's been okay in the first half. He has three receptions right now, but like 12 yards. But, I mean, the Arizona quarterbacks have relied on the tight ends quite a bit, and McBride played a ton of snaps on um, in Week 11. He's played all the snaps in Week 12, so uh, I don't hate Trey McBride. Um, but other than that, it's like it's kind of, I mean, like Dolchich at this point. Like we can suggest the same people that we suggest every week, right? Like Greg Dolchich is probably available. I guess maybe a flyer, and I don't know what your take on this is, because maybe a lot of people forgot about him because he played on Thursday night. Um, but Austin Hooper had two touchdowns, uh, back-to-back games of four or more receptions, 11 targets over the last two weeks. Is that, or is Austin Hooper a guy, or should we just like move on and pretend like we didn't even know Austin Hooper's name? I can get excited about Hooper because I remember in the preseason and when we were doing you know draft prep and everything, early on when the Titans were doing – you know, mini camps, OTAs, Hooper and Tannehill were kind of there were those little reports that they were doing this year what Cooper Cup and Matthew Stafford right. did last year. And I thought, you know, may I wasn't going to put all my eggs in in the Austin Hooper basket, but I thought that you know maybe this would be worth a late round flyer. Uh, I was pretty intrigued, and then because you had to look at the rest of the landscape at the time, like uh, Traylon Burks wasn't practicing, Robert Woods was right. recovering from. It really did seem like Austin Hooper could start the season as a top two target right. for Ryan Tannehill. Um, but it, it took a while. It did culminate in two touchdowns for him last week. You can't expect that going forward. Essentially, with the tight end position, you're just hoping the guy that you stream gets one touchdown and <laughs> at least, you know, 
enough to get you seven to nine points, even in right. a PPR format, because that's a relatively good floor, and you can just you know catch the ceiling with your other players. So I don't hate the call to go to Austin Hooper as a possible replacement. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's not like something I'm like overly excited about. But you just mentioned it; it's really <clears throat> the just the landscape of the tight end position at this point is just it's trash. Is trash, and it's like again, we we can talk about it all we want, but like there's no bigger advantage to having Travis Kelsey and like just goes to show you like as long as Patrick Mahomes is his quarterback like just draft just draft Kelsey so you don't have to worry about it just draft Travis Kelsey so you don't have to worry about this week in week out um I hope Kyle Pitts has a speedy recovery but uh there are some decent targets on the waiver wire right now uh Joe Mixon is in the concussion protocol how much of a priority are you making Samaj P Ryan in terms of waiver wire acquisitions this week or would you prefer someone like Isaiah Pacheco, who does look to be like he's taking over as the lead back in Kansas City? But I tread carefully with that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it definitely doesn't hurt Pacheco's case that <clears throat> Clyde edwards helaire has the high ankle sprain, and the high ankle sprain is going to keep him out. You know, typically three to six weeks. That's been the mo for anyone with the high ankle sprain. Um, and McKinnon fumbled yesterday too, so. Yeah. It is Isaiah Pacheco's backfield. The problem is he'll never be in those passing situations. That is going to continue to be Jarek McKinnon. That's, I mean, McKinnon thrives in the two-minute drill. He thrives, and, and we know the Chiefs can throw 40, 50 times. Um, so I like Pacheco. Um, but like, even in a game where he has 100-something yards, no receptions or barely gets into double figures because that's all he does, right? Like, he just rushes the ball. Uh, we need some, like, we. It, it's, the problem is, like, Derrick Henry is someone like that, or Nick Chubb, but they score touchdowns. Like, we need to start seeing touchdown equity out of Pacheco. Um, <clears throat> I think he holds more value than P. Ryan long-term because Pacheco is seemingly the RB1. We were told that eventually it would be his backfield. M- mix an in-concussion protocol, but on his Instagram was dancing after the game with his teammates, like, at worst, it seems like a one-week injury, um, and I think P. Ryan, you know, at this point, we need points, right? Like, we need wins. P. Ryan is definitely viable on the waiver wire. I wouldn't go below all my fab on him, um, but I think he's viable. I think he's a one-week replacement probably at best, um, and, you know, Pacheco is long-term, has more viability, um, but P. Ryan for sure valuable in a one-week setting because we haven't seen many players – return one week after they're concussed. No, especially after the debacle with Tua Tungo I think it, I think it's safe to – it's Monday, and I would say it's probably a 70 to 80% chance that makes and misses this week. Right. Just right. because the NFL can't handle another right. situation like Tua. Um, but Justin Fields is day-to-day with a shoulder injury, although Matt Eberflis – I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Iberflus? Iberflus, yep. Okay. Uh, well, the Bears head coach didn't necessarily rule out his season-ending designation. Dude, unreal. Which, it's insane. How can a guy be day-to-day, but you're also considering just shutting him down? That's I don't get it, but whatever. Let the Bears be the Bears. Um, is it time to see what you can get for Justin Fields? Maybe hope that you know someone is still willing to buy into all the rushing upside because between the injury and the upcoming schedule – the outlook is a little more bleak as opposed to what he's done and how he shot up the rankings the past, you know, three to four weeks. Yeah, I mean, like when I originally heard the uh, the Eberflus thing, like I was kind of shocked. Um, what was the report? The official report um, was – he has le- – it's a left shoulder dislocation is the official um, <clears throat> diagnosis on on fields. Yeah, I mean, selling high is definitely good. It's just we, – we've talked – we've kind of talked about this a lot, Dan. Like, what is – who at quarterback can you get? Now knowing that he – there's an injury, right, to the shoulder, um, what quarterback is, like, valuable enough in a trade – um, for Justin Fields, like this, obviously hinders his upside. Um, I just, but also like you're, if he does play, 
you're selling yourself short if he if he just remains the quarterback for the year because we just I mean look at look at what he's doing on the ground so it's t- it's a really really tough position to be in you obviously need a backup plan I think um, guys on the waiver wire you know are like Andy Dalton and probably Tannehill and Kenny Pickett. Like those are probably your, your only options at this point. Daniel Jones, probably too high. Daniel Jones is, yeah. Daniel Jones is probably, what's his roster ship and the shallowest of leagues probably. Yeah. I mean, in a 14 team league, I'm in like Aaron Rodgers is available, but that was, I mean, you know, uh, assuming out of necessity, Daniel Jones is, for 73% rostered in the ESPN league. So um, you're looking at guys under 50% is Mariota. Um, I mean, Stafford, but he's now concussed for the second. I mean, it's like it's like Garoppolo, Jared Goff, Andy Dalton. I would say Brissett 100%, but now we get the bye week and then the return of, or we get the return of um, Deshaun Watson next week. Um, Tannehill, Matt Ryan, Kenny Pickett. So, like, yeah, float them out there in trades, but, like, also have a backup plan on the waiver wire because if he if he gets ru- – we're going to find out more on Wednesday, right? We're going to know on Wednesday when the first official media um, – the open portion of practice for the media comes around <clears throat> and he's practicing or he's not, um, we'll know. So uh, have have a plan in place, especially if nobody's biting on your um, on your trade offers. Cool, cool. Uh, let's touch on some high-profile NFC teams that didn't look great in Week 11. Uh, are the Minnesota Vikings frauds? They were held to a whopping <laughs> three points. Now, granted, Dallas has one of the best defenses in the league, but Kirk Cousins was sacked seven times. He only threw for 105 yards. Uh, is this just a one-off bad game against a stout defense because they do have another tough matchup this Thursday night against my New England Patriots? Another stout defense that just held the high-octane New York Jets to a field goal. Uh, but uh, any cause for concern for the Minnesota Vikings? I was finally buying into them as a good team, and this gave me this really caused me to pump the brakes because I was, uh, I don't know, I, I couldn't believe that they were <laughs> this bad in what should have been uh, the game of the week. Yeah, I think you, along with everybody, right? Like, that was literally the the shift. Like, everyone was like, all right, on the bandwagon. And then the bandwagon. Especially after what they did to the, the, the Bills game before. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I think it will. Look, we get Cousins. We get Cousins in another primetime game, right? I think this is going to be the. <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> this is going to be, this is going to be the tell-all. For Kirk Cousins, the like I don't want to say this is gonna be for like the tell all for the rest of his career, but like this might be the tell all for the rest of his career. Like, is Kirk Cousins going to show up in prime time? Yes or no? He gets another prime time game. We've seen him in two prime time games this year, Dan. They got torched against Philly. They got torched against Dallas. Um, here's the third one, and it's against a top five defense in football. And maybe I'm selling the Patriots a little short there. It might be even better. It's probably even better than that. So um, I don't know if they're frauds. They have a boatload of talent. They might have the best receiver. They have a top five running back in the league, potentially. They have a top three receiver, top two receiver. They have a potential top five tight end. Like they have a ton of skilled positions. But they lost their one of their best offensive linemen in Christian Darishaw this week. He's already ruled out for Week 12. Tough sledding against uh, New England, man. I mean, Matthew Judon. How many sacks is Matthew Judon going to have? It's going to be he's going to be counting sacks like LeBron did when he went to Miami about how many rings he was going to win there. So um, we're going to see. I don't know if they're frauds. I mean, I think they're clearly going to win the division. I'll say that right. Like they're going to win their division. Unless the Lions continue to play a little well, as well as they have, um, I don't know. I don't know if they're frauds, uh, but Thursday night is going to tell us a lot about who they are as a team. Uh, another team that, for the second week in a row, second time in really like a seven-day span, that really underperformed, and we talked about them pretty much live during while we were recording the podcast last week. But are the Philadelphia Eagles frauds? Uh, 
two straight games that the Eagles just didn't look like the Eagles. Unfortunately, they did rally to win Sunday's game, but it was against the Colts. Uh, Jalen Hurts has thrown for just 400 total yards in his last two games, but he has found the end zone on the ground the last two weeks. He had over, I think, 80 rushing yards on Sunday. So that'll, uh, I guess, quell a lot of concerns regarding the rushing upside. Um, but overall, the Eagles' run defense is pretty weak without Jordan Davis, and they did go out and sign Ndamukong Sue uh, in the early last week, roughly. But do we think that they return to being one of the more imposing offenses in the league? Because during that game, they flashed a very strange stat, uh, and it was like the Philadelphia Eagles' like points by quarter. And the Eagles were like, 13th in like first quarter points first in second quarter points by like a mile they've put up over 100 points in the second quarter and then the third and fourth quarter which we've seen because earlier in the year they were getting out to huge leads and they just kind of take their foot off the gas in the second half but even in the third and fourth quarter <clears throat> they're like outside the top 25 in points scored in those quarters so it's like they get off to a nice start and then it's like most of the nerves are that they just get out to such a huge comfortable lead but the this team just is fairly inconsistent. It, it, it you can go it goes drive to drive. They looked awesome in the first quarter last week against the Commanders, and then they looked like crap the rest of the game. And this was another game where the the Colts defense is getting a little more healthy, and they do sure. have good players. But at the same time, we expect more than what 17, 18 points from the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they're frauds because I think you brought up. I mean, the Colts do have good players. Like, on paper, I think a lot of people probably pick them to win that division, um, Just especially with, like, what Tennessee did and, like, they traded A.J. Brown before the season. It's like, oh, Derrick Henry coming off a major injury. Oh, they're the Colts. this is the Colts' division. Um, and then it wasn't. And then Frank Wright gets fired and stuff. Um, also, like, the Eagles' commanders. I mean, dude, the commanders are the hottest team in football right now, right? I mean. Uh, they're on a roll. They are and they're won, getting Chase Young back this week. Yeah, and they get Chase Young back this week. They've won five of six games. Um, so, like, I wouldn't say that was a big surprise. Dude, look, division games are tough, man. Like, the Jets offense had two yards against your Patriots, but the Patriots only scored three points. Like, it's just being in a division game alone is tough. Um, I wouldn't say the Eagles are frauds. I still think that they are – the prim, like one of the premier teams in football. The only problem is you look at the NFC, right? Dallas obviously stock way up on Dallas. Um, seven and three Thursday night. We'll see what happens with the Giants, but stock way up. The Commanders stock way up. The Giants are still seven and three. Then you go the Vikings, despite getting blown out and despite losing to the Eagles, eight and two. The 49ers went out and traded for Christian McCaffrey, and everyone thinks that they're a wagon. Um, there's a lot of good teams. And then, obviously, the Brady narrative is just always going to be the Brady narrative. As long as he gets in the playoffs, we know he can go on a run. There is a lot of good teams in the NFC. So would it surprise me if the Eagles didn't make the Super Bowl? No, it wouldn't. The I picked the Cowboys before the year in our bold predictions to represent the NFC, and I still think that's going to be the case, especially if they – if and when they go beat the Giants and sign OBJ, because that seems imminent. Um, I, I don't know. I don't. I wouldn't call the Eagles frauds, um, but I don't. I guess I don't know what success would be from their standpoint. Like NFC Championship game, could we consider them frauds if they are the best team going into the postseason, or they lose before the NFC Championship game? I don't know, but I, I still think they're real. I think they ran into two good teams in a row, um, and look. Nobody's the 72 Dolphins, dude. Nobody goes uh, 19 0, not even your your uh, 27 Patriots. Shh. I'm trying to. <laughs> um, no, but I agree. I still think that they they can be a wagon. Uh, that, that defense, I feel so much better about them um, when Jordan Davis is there. God, that. Good. And I love the guy because he played at University of Georgia. And I'm not a huge Bulldogs fan or anything, but, you know, I was able to just follow him closely. And he's right. just a very likable guy. So I, I, I do like seeing him on the field. Uh, <clears throat> but let's talk uh, a little bit of Thanksgiving, some Turkey Day. This is arguably my favorite NFL DFS slate of the year. Uh, it's a great day for just big meals, adult beverages, football, naps. Both of our teams are in action. Hell yeah. Uh, so probably the person, probably the person, last, probably the person last time. 
that were both <laughs> yeah thanksgiving <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh I, this is kind of like a very open-ended question do you have any like solid thanksgiving traditions or you know if you want to keep this football oriented do you have any early plays uh heading into the three game dfs slate for thursday um i wouldn't say traditions but um uh, something that my wife and i are probably <clears throat> going to get into with our child um so i wouldn't say um traditions in terms of dfs plays yeah really Contrarian plays are uh, Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs, uh, Saquon Barkley. Um, <laughs> <I don't> see... <laughs> Those are some really contrarian options. Um, no, I mean, look, I think um, it, it's it's an interesting slate, right? Because Detroit's defense has been really good um, lately. Buffalo's offense turns the ball over a lot, but obviously they're who they are. Um, the Giants might have been solved against the Lions, uh, where, which is eight receivers in the box. They just lost Wanda Robinson. Um, we've already lost to Dallas and Cooper Rush. Uh, so, like, doubt, I would say, like, <laughs> the first, I know this is going to sound weird, but the Cowboys defense might be the first play in my lineup on Thanksgiving. Um, they get to the quarterback better than anyone else in the league. They force a lot of turnovers, and we saw Daniel Jones turn the ball over twice this past week, and they shut down Saquon. And if they're going to stuff the box and get to the quarterback, Giants aren't going to score. Um, and then New England, um, I wish there was an answer. Uh, it's Ramondre Stevenson or, or Bust, I think, offensively. I, I really like Ramondre, <clears throat> even with Damian Harris back. Um, Ramondre just continues to be a stud in the passing game. And what did we just see Tony Pollard do against Minnesota? Two 30-plus yard touchdown receptions. Uh, I think Ramondre could be in for a big day on uh, on Turkey Day. I haven't looked too much at the positional plays, but I, I do the DST coach over on Fantasy Alarm. And usually for the th- the Thanksgiving slate, I will write up each defense because there's only six, so I don't mind right. taking the time just to do a paragraph on each one. Honestly, <laughs> I don't hate the Lions this week. Right. Uh, they're home. Now, granted, Buffalo did just play in Detroit last week. But the Lions have put up double-digit fantasy points in three straight games. They are forcing a lot of turnovers, as it is right now. And sure, like, the Buffalo Bills are a little bit concerning, um, obviously, because they're one of the best offenses in the league. But Josh Allen does lead the league in turnovers. Um, And I say this – I try to preach this almost every week at least once, depending on the team that I'm running up. This is a position of variance. Uh, you You can go from not hitting value to breaking the slate just with a pick six <laughs> with with a with a return for a touchdown just anything and so for 2100 if they just don't get in the negative i'll be happy right. and it's a short week for every team you know the giants cowboys game has the highest total on the board uh, of, of all these three games but keep in mind all of these teams are playing on a short week so right. any game could be ugly and this is the earliest one on the slate and so i'm willing to take a chance not in every lineup and i'm not going to the, the Lions defense won't be a team that I'm building around, but they're 2,100. They allow you to just pretty much allocate and spend up for studs everywhere else on the board. So I don't mind taking a shot at a $2,100 defense. And I think that a lot of people in the DFS industry, you know, sharks and common players, I think they are getting on board yep. with just paying way down to DST and just hoping for the best. And anything can happen. I agree. Um, side note, Dan, do you, think, do you think that uh... – Buffalo stays in Detroit this week. They are they, they played should. at Ford Field literally this past <clears> week in the in when it was supposed to be the snow game, and now they play. Like, do you think they're going home? I feel like that would kind of give them an advantage if they just stayed because they should just stay. Um, yeah, makes you wonder. I wonder. I wonder what like the routine if they. If they well, travel it's like when, or it's like when a lot of West Coast teams come East Coast and it's like uh you know, if they're gonna be playing another East Coast team the following week, they just stay out here. Right. You've already adjusted your body clock. And so, you know, why go back west when you have to throw your body clock off again? True. And so, you know, just stay just stay there. Why <laughs> why would they fly home Sunday just to fly back to Detroit on Wednesday? It's a good point. I took no, it's a good point, but like you also, it just makes you wonder, like, how regimented teams are and, like, players are. And, like, I want to go home and do this, 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 right? Like, this is the way I do it. I do it here. And then I, and then we travel on this. I don't know. Just, just a thought. Didn't really 
hit me that they were playing in Detroit. I wonder how many times that's ever happened. Like two, an away team, away game in the same stadium. Like it obviously probably happens if you play the Giants and the Jets. Like you're in the, just in the same stadium, or like if you're playing like the Clippers and the Lakers in the NBA. But uh, interesting, they're I they're the home if, team. I do wonder if like in recent years, if there's been a team that has visited Southern California and they've had to play the Chargers and Rams back to back weeks. Mm, true, because you're playing at SoFi. True. Play. That's a good. That's a good point. I can't think of anyone off the top of my head, but I wonder if it's happened. Schedule makers would be very appreciated if that was the case. That they would give a team two weeks in LA like that. Yeah. Uh, but Grande, uh, I hope you and your family have a safe and uh, wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, same goes out to our uh, family and our FA Nation. But best of luck to you on the Thanksgiving slate.